Today we're going to talk about plant genetics. This lecture is part of the subject Agricultural Technologies, which is offered at NMIT as part of the Agricultural Degree. My name is Nikki Cooley and I'm going to be talking about this subject today. This lecture on plant genetics is part of a series of lectures on the topic of genetics and breeding. In order for you to understand some of the concepts presented in this lecture, you will, be need to, you will need to be familiar with some of the concepts of genetics. These are covered in the first two lectures in this series on an introduction to genetics. I'd like to start by talking about the science of plant breeding. Conceptually, plant breeding is the changing of genetics in order to produce desirable traits or characteristics. Plant breeding can be accomplished through many different techniques, ranging from simply selecting plants with desirable characteristics for propagation to much more complex molecular techniques. There are several concepts of plant breeding that are good to familiarise yourself with. The first I'd like to introduce to you is the role of variation. Every individual has variation in its genetic code compared to another individual in a given population. In traditional plant breeding, we started from plant populations with large variation. As selection has occurred, this variation has become smaller and smaller, and so in the 20th century, many of our crops have a low degree of variation. This means that the number of suitable traits that we may select from within our current crops are very reduced. As you can see, this causes a bit of a problem for geneticists and plant breeders. Another concept to familiarise yourself with is that plants regularly have stomatic mutations. These mutations can contribute to germline as flowers develop at the end of branches composed of stomatic cells. Some plant species are capable of self-fertilisation and some are nearly exclusively self-fertilisers. What we mean by self-fertilisation is that the parent is both the mother and the father to the offspring. This is not common in animals, but there are some examples such as aardvarks. Uh, <laughs> Polyploidal individuals, if capable of self-fertilizing, can give rise to a, genet a new genetically distinct lineage, which can be the start of a new species. The final concept I'd like to introduce to you here in these lectures is that hybrids between plant species are easy to create by hand pollination and may be more successful on average than hybrids between animal species. In the introductory lecture on genetics, we looked at the method of hand pollination and you can refer back to these lectures for more details. Tens of thousands of offspring can be created from a single cross to obtain a single individual with desirable characteristics. So let us have a look at some of these modern practices. I will point out here that there isn't enough time to go into all of the areas of plant genetics in the detail that I would like. However, we will have enough time to introduce some of these concepts to you. So one of the first trends that we are seeing in recent genetics is a return to using wild type for the variation. This is very time consuming and can be expensive, however does allow a new source of variation to enter the, genetic pop, the genetics. Mutagenesis is genetic information of an organism which is changed in a stable manner resulting in a mutation. This is certainly a practice that enables new variation in the population. Transgenesis is the process of introducing an exogenous gene and hybrids, where offspring resulting from the interbreeding between two animals or plants of different species is undertaken. Also, we see the practices of wild crosses. I'd like to differentiate between empirical breeding and scientific breeding. 
Empirical breeding is a form of breeding that utilises informed trial and error to affect crop improvement. Developed before the science that supports these improvements were understood, there are some exceptional good outcomes for this kind of breeding. Example of this practice, a farmer would only select seed from the best plants that had an excellent crop and thus selecting for seed number and, and yield attributes. It used to be common practice that a farmer would keep a component of his seed every year and plant a small section of the field with this seed, thus obtaining new and sustaining old variation in his crop. So now let's look at scientific breeding. In scientific breeding, the assumptions underpinning this breeding are based on the partial understanding of the traits that regulate the agronomic performance of the crop. Some knowledge is also required on how to manipulate these traits. Below is a figure showing the conceptual stages of scientific breeding. The trait of interest is identified. The location of the trait on the chromosome of the protein coding this uh, trait is identified. Manipulation of the chromosome or expression of the trait, that is, can be switched on or off. In, in this component, we say the trait is upregulated or downregulated. Taking this manipulation of the crop, usually via the seed or cutting, and this completes the stages of scientific breeding. I'm going to try and show the differences between empirical and scientific breeding by giving you a visual representation of these differences. Please excuse the terrible drawing, but here is a representation of some of the individuals of our plants. This is the typical individual and what most of the variation in the population looks like. <coughs> In this example, we're paid on fruit size. As you can see, there are some shorter and some taller versions of this crop. The real skill in empirical breeding was selecting the individuals of which you were going to choose. As I have just informed you, we were paid on crop size. It makes sense to choose the individuals with the largest fruit. Here we have an example of the most of the variation. This is a strong individual but its fruit size is quite small. Here the grower has selected a plant with a large fruit. The reason the plant the grower doesn't just use this plant is that it may not have all the genetic <coughs> characteristics like disease resistance that he knows that most of these plants exhibit. Therefore he would take this parent and cross it with this parent to produce new offspring. Scientific breeding, however, would take this individual. It would identify the trait or traits that result in the larger fruit. It would know and be able to locate these traits on the, on the chromosome. It would man, um, be able to manipulate the chromosome and thus take this trait back into this individual. And these are how these two different types of breeding differ. In the figure on the screen produced by Professor Patrick Desjardins, <coughs> we can see where some of the new technologies are integrated in, in the drivers for change. For example, we have the new genomics, which is um, a suite of techniques that allow us to look at new breeding strategies propagation techniques and the development of becoming more efficient and effective at these are also very important inputs. There are the demands from industry and the consumer <coughs> which, are dry, which are causing the drivers for change on a regular basis, particularly in commercial farming. And then there are the new demands from society about how these drivers should change should look like and what these technologies are and how they should be used. These resulting drivers for change lead some new challenges for plant gen uh, genetics. These challenges include creating novel combinations of alleles. 
fixing desirable combinations for the market release and controlling gene flow, especially for novel non-food traits. So what is the gene gun method? Well, it's a method for introducing genes. It was developed for in vivo, that's within a living organism, transformation. It's used extensively in transforming monocots. One such example is the transformation of rice. This approach, as the name suggests, literally shoots genes into the plant cells and the plant cell chloroplasts. DNA is coated onto small gold particles of gold or tungsten, which are approximately two micrometers in diameter, or very small. This occurs in a vacuum chamber. The particles are propelled at very high velocities using a shot pulse or a high pressure helium gas, and hit a fine mesh battle baffle balanced above the tissue while the DNA coating continues into any target cell or tissue. On the figure on the screen you'll see an illustration of the gene gun method. In the petri dish we have some plant cells. In the vacuum cha chamber we place the petri dish and this anal allows us to, uh, using helium, to shoot the DNA that's suspended on the gold coating. So the gold coating acts as a carrier. The gene then goes into the plant tissues. As the plant grows and cells reproduce, these characteristics or traits are produced into the new plant. The new plant is then transferred from the tissue culture into a pot and environment and it's grown up where its seeds can be collected or it can be propagated. One of the most risky parts of this procedure is actually taking the plant from the sterile tissue culture and climate into a more um, general climate. This is often where plants can fail. I have found two YouTube videos which enable you to get a visual representation of how the gene gun works. Please stop the video here and click on the links below to see these videos. Now let us talk about another way that um, genes can get into plants. This is called the agrobacterium method. Sometimes it's referred to as the agrobacterium tumefacations mediated gun transfer. It is a method for transferring genetic material into a plant cell using the organism agrobacterium. Transformation via agrobacterium has been successfully practiced in dicots and in some monocots. It has a greater frequency of single site insertions of the foreign DNA. Here we have a visual representation of how the agrobacterium method works. The first thing you need to do is make a plasmid. A plasmid which contains your T DNA or your transfer DNA. This is the component of the DNA that you wish to get into your plant. Once you have your tDNA in your agrobacterium, 
it can then transfer this genetic information into the plant. The ability for agrobacterium to transfer genetic, the, geno, the genes into the plant of interest is based on the characteristics that this gram-negative bacterium has. It infects plants naturally and causes crown gall disease. The figure on the screen shows an example of crown gall disease. It has a tumour-inducing function in the agrobacterium. So let us look at this process in a bit more detail. You choose a trait of interest. Let's just say it could be something like herbicide resistance. You identify the genes that encode this trait. You then make a plasmid. Within this plasmid, you, you place the genes that are exhibiting the trait of interest. Your next stage is then to insert this plasmid into the agrobacterium. This is done by a, a number of techniques, but such examples of you expose the agrobacterium to heat shock or sonication. Plants are then incubated with the agrobacterium. This actually means that the plant is infected with the agrobacterium. You select the plant, you make a wound, and you place the agrobacterium onto the plant. The agrobacterium attaches to the plant cell wall and transfers the DNA, the, trans the DNA proportion of the TI plasmid into the host. This insertion or placement of the, of the genetic code of interest is, occurs randomly. So that means that some cells will have it and some cells will not. Cells will multiply, producing a callus. You use antibiotics to select only the plants that have been transformed or that have the genetic material of interest. From these cells, you can then produce or grow a whole transgenic plant. This whole transgenic plant, as seen in figure D, will exhibit the trait of interest. For example, as used in this example, herbicide resistance. And this is the whole process of how agrobacterium works. If you are still having problems with understanding the um, agrobacterium transformation technique, I have found an additional resource the Science of Agriculture, a Biological Approach by Ray Heron. If you look at Chapter 5 on Genetic Engineering, page 122, there is an illustration and a description of this method. This book is located in the NMIT Epping Library at the code on your screen. I also want to draw to your attention that the reading of this chapter from pages 117 to 139 is a requirement of this topic and you may be examined on this material. A second resource I'd like you to spend some time reading is a paper on the, the use of plant genetic resources and biodiversity in classical plant breeding. This is an excellent summary of classical plant breeding and how these technologies have evolved and information specifically about variation and the, play and the role it plays in modern day agriculture. It is indeed one of the most important challenges that plant breeders have to face. Please refer to Moodle for a full copy of this paper. There are also associated questions. Please answer these questions and bring your answers to the tutorial on plant genetics. Components of this paper will be examined in this subject. I hope that after listening to this lecture on plant genetics and completing the recommended reading that you have been given with this topic, you will have an overall understanding of plant breeding and plant genetics. Particularly, you will understand the role that variation plays in breeding and the roles of modern techniques and how these can be used in order to increase variation
and the traits that we can obtain. I hope that you understand some of these techniques in detail, particularly the gun and the agrobacterium methods for transferring genes into plants. Thank you very much for your time.